Franchi Talks Japanese. I, I am Franchi and I'm so happy that I'm finally making a new video. Now, if uh, any of you have been following me on Facebook or Instagram, maybe you have noticed that I've been working on a column, let's say, for the Facebook page of the Museum of Oriental Art Edoardo Chiossone in Genoa. And with them, we've been working on this column, which is Chiusone Cross Ghost of Tsushima, where we look at objects from their collection, uh, in a way inspired by playing the video game Ghost of Tsushima. I mentioned it in my previous video as well. So for this video, I would like to take that into, let's say, YouTube into a video form and also look at objects from their collection which are connected to the samurai world, so armors and so on. And let's say I was inspired by the Ghost of Tsushima video game. Uh, you might notice that some of the content might, let's say, repeat, but it's not gonna be the same as the post, not its, its entirety. I will have make an effort to add more details, to add more photos, and also I will talk about different objects. And what if you have never played Ghost of Tsushima? What if you don't play video games at all? I don't really think it matters because if you like samurai, if you like craftsmanship and battle equipment, then you are in the right place. And what else? I just wanted to say, as usual, that there will be English and Italian subtitles available if you need them and also timestamps in the description. So let's jump right in. Let's start with a little intro about let's say the setting of the video game. Ghost of Tsushima is set during the first Mongol invasion of Japan which took place in the year 1274. This uh, invasion arrived from Korea because the Korean Peninsula had already been subjected to Mongol rule by the Khan, the Kublai Khan. And of, because of this, one of the main theatres of the battles was the island of Tsushima. Tsushima, in fact, is placed between the Korean Peninsula and the rest of the Japanese archipelago. And so, it was up to the So clan, which ruled Tsushima, to defend uh, the whole Japanese archipelago from the Mongol invasion. Of course, other clans joined later, sent by the shogunate, but Tsushima was the main theatre of the battle. And uh, according to the written history of the So clan, the So Shi Kapu, uh, 80 samurai warriors were left, were defending the island against 8,000 Mongol troops. So that tells us how the battle went. Of course, it was very difficult for the Japanese to oppose this invasion and uh, there was a lot of strong, hard battles going on. The invasion started in the morning at 4 a.m. and by the evening of that day, by the night, all Japanese resistance had been eliminated. And in the Soshi Kafu, of course, we can find stories of legendary battles, legendary efforts by the Japanese. And it even says that by the night, the waters around the island of Tsushima were red because of the blood that had been spilled. Of course, you can see how hard the battling was and how hard the Mongol invasion had struck the island in the video game Ghost of Tsushima. And the main protagonist is a samurai warrior. He is called Jin Sakai. Most of his um, fellow samurai have been killed and he finds himself in battling alongside warrior monks, common people, peasants and so on. And Jin Sakai was my main inspiration, let's say, uh, looking at his equipment and his armor when selecting objects from the collection of the Museo Chiusone in Genoa. So let's start by looking at a very important part of samurai armor, which is the do, uh, the cuirass. We are looking at the ones that Jin Sakai 
uh, wares in the game, well, one of multiple, and it's in a style called Domaru. This style was developed during the Heian period, so very early on, around the 10th century. And it was used at first mostly by infantry men. Uh, in fact, the most important retainers who fought on horse uh, didn't used to wear the domaru, they used to wear oiroi instead. Oiroi is a kind of boxy, big, heavy armor. It was often beautifully decorated and served almost as a status symbol for the retainer. And uh, the oiroi was effective, especially on horse. However, it wasn't very easy to move in, also because of the weight and because of, of the shape. And for this reason, infantry men who had to walk and <laughs> didn't have a horse, they developed, uh, they started using instead this armor, the domar, which is lighter, uh, more comfortable to walk around in. So it worked better for them. And with time, actually, also major lords appreciated the Domaru and started using this style of armor instead. And the Mongol invasion uh, also created an appreciation for the Domaru. Because if you have played the game, or if you know anything about the Mongol invasion, or I can tell you, <laughs> um, the Mongols inv invasion uh, created very serious difficulties for the samurai because of the fighting style. At the time, the samurai was still fighting in very ritualized set battles. So often it included duels, calling out the name of your enemy. And the Mongols did not follow any of these strategies. They usually attacked in groups uh, they knew how to work as a unit and also used catapults or incendiary bombs to which the samurai were not used at all. And you can imagine that in this kind of, of situation you might need to move quickly with or without a horse. So being stuck in a big heavy armor in which it is hard to move is not the best. So this kind of new fighting style, which was necessary, also helped develop a new conception of the Domaru armor. Of course we mentioned the Do, but this is not the only part of the armor. If we want to look at it as a whole, it's made of a variety of sections. I'm not going to list them all because it's a little bit boring and it would take some time, but I will make an effort to put a picture here so you can have a quick look. And I will mention the most important parts. So we find the Do, which covers the torso, and attached to it we can find the Kusatsuri, which uh, covers the upper part of the legs, the thighs. The Suneate are below and they cover the shins. And then, of course, we find also so the, the uh, protection for the shoulders. In the Domaro style armor, the most interesting and important characteristic is that all of these parts are lamellar, which means that they are made up of small scales which are lacquered and tied together with laces. The scales could be made of leather or iron, of course, iron is more protective, so one would tend to think they would go for iron, but this was not always the case, or not completely the case, because iron was more protective, but it's also heavier and more expensive, so sometimes the scales were alternated between leather and iron ones to make a cheaper and or lighter armor. And the Laces as well could be made either of leather or silk. Silk, of course, it's found, I think, more often, especially in the later armors, and it's beautiful, beautiful because it's often dyed and colored. We mentioned how they were dyed and decorated. We have to say that 
it is impossible to not be in awe at the level of craft craftsmanship which was involved in the making of a samurai armor. If we think going from the small scales, kozane, which are made of course individually and had to be of the perfect shape, size and width. And I can also think of the making of the leather laces, uh, thinking of the color schemes in which they were arranged and the lacquer um, work up, which was applied on this case. All of these took a lot of time and a lot of work. So we really have to think about this when we look at an armor set. So now that we have looked at the armor worn by Jin Sakai and we introduced the Tomar a little bit, I jump into the collection of the Kyosone Museum and show you this set of armor. This set dates to the 19th century and it was owned by the Hosokawa clan and it is now found in a museum collection. And let's have a good look. We can see some characteristics which are present bo both in the Domaru by Jin Sakai and in this armor. For example, the Do is made of scales, which we talked about, the Kozane. And also, this armor presents big square Sode, O Sode, the shoulder protection. The armor worn by Jin Sakai dates to the 13th century and this one to the mid 19th century. However, we can ask a question, how come they are so close? Didn't the armor styles evolve throughout time? Were they the same in Japan for all these centuries? And the answer is no. <laughs> Actually, there was a lot of changes and developments in Japanese armor. These changes sometimes happen because of necessity, for example, um, the arrival of the Europeans in Japan in the 16th century uh, came along with the introduction of firearms and firearms created the necessity for stronger, more resistant armors. And for example, the answer to this necessity was creating um, cuirasses made of big iron plates rather than small scales. Other times it was simply for uh, looking for better characteristics. So we mentioned that at some point the oyoroi became less used even by major samurai because uh, characteristics of lightness and comfort were sought after. So if there were all these changes in um, samurai armor style, how comes that this, uh, this armor from the Kyosone Museum dated to the Edo period is so similar to um, Japanese armor style which dates back to the Heian period? And the answer is a revival style. In fact, the armor from the Kyosone Museum uh, is dated, we said, to the Edo period. This period is a period of peace in Japan. We find the Pax Tokugawa. So 300 years almost of no fighting on the Japanese archipelago. This brings the samurai to become administrator, let's say. They lose their figure of warriors. They are still warriors, but they do not battle. And so they administrate the land and they cover these different functions. However, some of the samurai are also wondering about their role in this society. And many times the answer is found on their, in their ancestors and in the stories and in the legendary figures of the past. And among these we find, for example, the legendary warriors of the Genpei Wars in the 12th century and of the Mongol invasions. So <laughs> this, uh, this um, let's say, interest in the past, it is also materially uh, shown in this armor because not only the samurai are interested in theory about this past, they also want to have it materially shown in their armor. 
So they ask their craftsmen, the armor workers, to make armors which are connected to the past, which present ancient characteristics, such as the scales or the big shoulders. And we also need to mention that because this is a time of peace, the workers, they have time to really focus on the aesthetic appeal of the armors. Of course, it's already been there, armors were always beautiful in Japan. However, this time they can really think of the aesthetic side first. They don't need to focus on the battle readiness first. And so many scholars think that it was at this time that some of the most beautiful armors were made, although they might not be the most useful in battle. And this aesthetic uh, side of things, we can see it on this armor. What I particularly like is the lacing. We can see how neat, how perfectly organized it is. There is a lot of silk lacing on it and it follows also a um, color scheme which involves the color of white, purple and pale green. It might be a little bit hard to see. I think also the colors may have faded with time. However, we can still appreciate the neatness of this lacing, the perfection of it actually. And we can only imagine how much skill and how much work has gone into it, into creating this by part of the craftsman. And of course, let's not forget that the armor is accompanied by a helmet. This helmet is attributed to Saotome Iechika and dates back to the 16th century. And this takes me to the next topic about which I would like to talk today, which is indeed helmets. If we look at the video game, Jin Sakai seems to be able to choose only um, a specific type of helmet and this is the Suji Bachi Kabuto. This type of helmet is made of uh, several plates, of a dome made of several plates which are attached together and where the plates meet we can see some ridges. And this uh, type of helmet with ridges, uh, we can think they had a double function, or the ridges of the helmet had a double function. On one side, they could strengthen the structure of the dome of the helmet, so making it stronger and more well, better for battle. And on the other side, they could have an aesthetic function, which is really interesting. And because of this dual function, of these ridges and the structure of the helmet in general, uh, it became more popular during the Muromachi period. However, the game is set on the previous <laughs> historical period of Japanese history, the Kamakura period. So we can imagine that uh, Jin Sakai could have worn a different type of helmet as well, a uh, Hoshi Bachi Kabuto, which was developed since the Heian period and was, uh, let's say, the first style of helmet which developed independently on the Japanese archipelago because before then, of course, helmets existed, battles already took place. However, the, the helmets were inspired by Chinese counterparts. So Chinese helmets may have been introduced into Japan and the Japanese people may have made their own, but inspired by them. Well, this one is the first original <laughs> Japanese style. And we can imagine that Jin Sakai could have worn something like this as well. Something that we can note is that this type of helmet was developed during the Heian period, so in the 10th century, let's say, and then it was still worn during the 13th period, so also at the time of the Mongol invasion but it was also um, object of a revival in the 16th century, just in the same way that we mentioned a revival also of the armor of the Domaru. And of course, I'm going to show you uh, an example of a Hoshi Bachi Kabuto from the collection of the Kyosone Museum. So we can see this uh, 
the assignment. What is interesting about it is that it does not present a neck guard nor any other protections or decorative elements. What we can see is the dome. And because of this, we can actually look at its structure, have a good look at how the dome is made. So once again, we can see that it's made of plates. And in this case though, because of the style of Ahoshi Bashi Kabuto, the plates are covered by rivets in the shape of small bosses. This helmet in particular is made up of 13 plates which are joined together and we can see at the joining we can see the ridges. And another characteristic which we can see at the top is a hole called Tehen. This uh, hole is found both on the Sujibachi Kabuto and on the Hoshibachi Kabuto and the reason for its existence, and uh, uh, let's say we have several hypotheses, there isn't one clear answer to this. However, it seems that uh, its existence may have stem, stemmed from technical reasons, namely the difficulty of joining the plates at the top for the helmet makers. However, um, there are also other possible explanations, such as the fact that early samurai may have put their ponytail through the hole. And also there seems to have been a belief that the god of war, Hachiman, may have gone through the hole and possessed the warriors during the battle. For this reason, the hole is also known with the name of Hachimanza. And we can also see another characteristic at the front of the helmet. We can see three um, metal strips and two metal strips are present also at the back. These are Shino Gitare, they are bronze strips which have the function, of course, of strengthening the helmet. From the collection of the Kyosone Museum, we can also see another Hoshibachi Kabuto, in this case from the Muromachi period. We can see that this one is complete, as in it has both the other protective parts other than the dome and also the decorative elements. And we can have a good look. We can see the neck guard called Shikoro, which covers the whole of the back and sides of the neck. And this one is also made of uh, scales, the kozane, and these scales are uh, to kept together by silk lacing, just like the armor we saw earlier. And the silk lacing is beautiful in orange and blue colors. And we can see that the, uh, the neck guard ends at the extremities with two curved parts. These are the protections Fukigaeshi. The Fukigaeshi are also decorated and with orange silk lacing and we can also see the mon of the clan to which this the, uh, the owner of this uh, helmet belonged. In this case you can see the mon is of mulberry leaves. On the front of the helmet we also find the, uh, a decorative element known as maedate and in this case we can see it's in the shape of half moon this shape was uh, very popular among samurai and we can also see it in the helmet in <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. In general, the Maedate, they could have any shape. They, there's a variety of shapes. They were inspired sometimes by the natural world, sometimes by religious elements, religious figures, and uh, at times they could represent the mon uh, to which the samurai belonged. And in the uh, shapes of the maedate, the colors of the silk lacing of the shikoro, and also in the decoration of the fukigaeshi, I think it's here that you can see this appreciation and effort that the craftsmen uh, put into the aesthetic side of uh, Japanese armor, while at the same time, of course, uh, working hard in making uh, battle ready and strong equipment. And I think this duality is really fascinating 
And we will find it also in the last element of Japanese samurai armor, which I want to talk about today, which is uh, uh, face armor or face masks, men yoroi. You may have seen uh, samurai face masks before. We have to mention that at first, face masks for the samurai, they started as simple iron plates, which were shaped to stay under the chin. And their role was to uh, make it more stable and easier to tie the helmet under the chin. In fact, the helmet was always tied with big ropes under the chin. And uh, this guard, let's say, this iron play would make it easier and let more stable. However, with time, this part got connected to another part of head armor that covered the brow. And with time, it developed into a covering for the whole face. These uh, masks for samurai, they were made of iron and or leather. And usually, they, if made of iron, they were then lacquer. Then they usually have a dark brown color, while the inside is usually lacquered in a red color. And they had several functions. So. Usually the functions that are mentioned are of course of defense because they defend the face. The second one is that they would make it easier to tie the helmet uh, to the face and to the chin rather than not having anything. And the third function, which I think is also very important, is of creating uh, either having an intimidation effect or an or inspiring effect. In fact, we're gonna have a look and we can see all sorts of shapes and uh, looks on these uh, face masks. Just like other parts of the samurai armor, the face masks can come in different styles and different shapes. So we can have a look at the face mask from the Kyosone <laughs> Museum and uh, have a quick look at the different styles. We can mention the first the somen, which are, let's say, the most uh, sophisticated because they cover the whole face. Then we can find the menpo, which covers the lower part of the face, including the nose. Or alternatively, we can see the hanpo, which covers, once again, only the lower half of the face, however, without including the nose. And last, we can see the hapui, which covers the forehead and the cheeks. We can see that there is a variety of face masks included in the collection of the Kyosone Museum, and there is a variety of face masks that Jin Sakai can choose in the video game. However, I decided to talk about my favorite one from the Kyosone Museum, even though there isn't an exact correlation in the video game, I hope you don't mind. I was feeling a little bit rebellious, you know, just wanna show what I like. So let's have a look. So let's have a look at this some and this full face mask from the museum collection. This mask is made of metal, it is made of a copper alloy, and it is also presents parts which are gilded, for example, around the eyes and also parts of silver, speci specifically the teeth. Something amazing about this mask is that it is dated and signed by the maker. So let's have a look. It says, it has an inscription which reads, Juichi Daimyochi Yoshihiro Saku, which translates as it was made by Myochi Yoshihiro, an 11th generation craftsman, and the mask is dated to the year 1391. As you can see, the mask is of a brownish color, while the inner part is lacquered in a red color, and it represents a Tengu. A Tengu is a very powerful and somewhat malevolent spirit, which legendary, legendarily inhabits the forests and the high mountains of Japan. There are two types of Tengu, the Karasu Tengu and the Konoha Tengu, 
The Konoha Tengu, it's easy to recognize because it has a huge nose which distorts its face. And the one that we are looking at, it's also easy to recognize. It's a Karasu Tengu. This Tengu has a, usually a big, strong beak and a human body, however, with wings. And often it has talons instead of feet. I think this is a recurring theme in today's video, set of change and transformations. And Tengu underwent changes and evolutions as well. In fact, we mentioned that Tengu were generally malevolent and, and quite nasty. However, these characteristics seem to have changed throughout time. For example, in the oldest tales, it was said that Tengu used to abduct children, take them away and fly away. However, uh, later, the, when searching for missing children, it is said that the local people would also ask the Tengu to help. Or once again, tales from the 12th century uh, tell that Tengu used to destroy Buddhist temples, set them on fire, and so on. However, later, uh, the Tengu were also made the protectors of Buddhist temples, and we can see Tengu statues in the temples. So, they went from somewhat awful creatures <laughs> to protectors and collaborators with the people. Yet, one might wonder why would the samurai choose to wear a Tengu mask? And an answer can be, could be found, found in their connection to war. In fact, Tengu seem to really enjoy war, uh, take on several activities to start them, and they also like to possess men and side them to fight. Moreover, they are also perfectly able to use any weapon and defeat any mortals, apart from a few who might decide to take them on. So, <laughs> it seems appropriate for a warrior to wear a Tengu mask. So I hope you enjoyed looking at this mask. I surely want to be a Tengu now. And in general, I hope that you liked in this video. I decided to end it here with the topic of the face mask. Of course, feel free to let me know what you thought in the comments. I really enjoyed looking at all these different elements of Japanese armors. I definitely learned a lot. So let me know what you think. Of course, I will be making more videos in the future. So if you want to see more video, videos, make sure to subscribe. And also, if you want to keep in touch with me, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. The, all the links are as always in the description box. And I will make sure to also, of course, link the website and Facebook page of the Kisone Museum so you can learn about the museum as well and maybe visit it one day. Why not? And one last thing, if you would like to see more videos from me, you can also decide to support the channel. Every little bit helps in making me making more videos and making the channel more active. I will leave the link to that as well in the description box. But for now, I would like to just to thank you for watching uh, dedicating your time to me and inviting me into your house or your commute or wherever you watch this video and I hope to see you again next time. Bye!